Hey everybody and thank you for watching another video. My name is Merge and welcome to the Breaking Bad What If series that I call the Heisenverse. A series where we make a change somewhere in the Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul timeline and see how that one change ripples throughout the entire universe. And in this video we're going to explore the famous lost episode of Breaking Bad that was ultimately cut from the series. And although the script may or may not still be out there, with the help of an old reddit post and a couple of interviews, I'm here to bring the episode to life. And also, full disclaimer, this story is going to get pretty dark so you've been warned. And before we get started, if you could leave a like on this video to support the channel, I'd appreciate it. Now. Let's get into it. You're done. Walter and Jesse nervously get into the car before driving away from the junkyard, and as Tuco watches him leave, he begins to think to himself if he can actually trust his newest associates, and decides to put some feelers out to learn more about them. A couple days pass and Walter meets up with Jesse to talk about what they should do. And between Walter seeing Tuco's black Cadillac parked down the street from his house and Jesse spotting it riding through his neighborhood as well, they start to worry for their own safety thinking that they could be next. And when Jesse pulls out his recently purchased gun, when slamming it on the countertop, no words would need to be spoken to know what he means by this gesture. And at first, Walter is against this plan having never handled a gun before, let alone fired one. And when working out the logistics on how they'll even do it, there's not many scenarios that end with them surviving a shootout with Tuco, especially when they can't even open the chamber of the gun. So instead, Walter goes with a more discreet approach and decides to use ricin to poison them. And after cooking it up in Jesse's basement, they start to work on their pitch on how they're going to give it to him. It's a new meth formula we've been working on. Would you care to try it? Okay, well, what's, what's new about it? But when Walter receives a phone call from Hank who sends him a photo of a crime scene, he's left in shock when he sees Gonzo dead at the junkyard right along with Nodos. And they both go into panic mode as Walter gets the gun from Jesse and he tells him to just get out of town. Because if Tuco's killing his own guys, it's only a matter of time before he comes after them. And Walter leaves to check on his family as Jesse scrambles around for his things. But just outside, parked a few houses down, will be Tuco sitting in a beater car looking to be watching Jesse's home. And after seeing Walter leave, he ducks down in the seat in order for him not to be seen. And once the coast was clear, Tuco decides to pay Jesse a visit. Because he just nearly evaded the DEA and he knows with the heat on him that he has to get across the border to lay low. But he's not going to leave without his favorite cook. And being that he can't just walk up to Walter's door and ask him to come to Mexico, he's just going to get his mule boy to do it. So as Tuco walks up and knocks on the door, Jesse would assume that it's Walter who forgot something and doesn't even check to see who it is, which will be his biggest mistake because Tuco just forces his way inside. And without a gun, Jesse grabs a nearby bat telling him to get out. But when Tuco brandishes a gun, Jesse lowers the bat and says defensively, Ayo, I promise I didn't say anything to anybody, but if, if you want the money, you can have it back. And Tuco says with a half smile, I don't need your money, but I do need your ride. And as Jesse slowly goes into his pocket to get his keys to offer to him, Tuco tells him, you're driving. And Jesse being in no position to refuse, just slowly walks out the house with Tuco following behind him. And together they take a drive over to 308 Negra Arroyo Lane. Over at Walter's house, after pulling into the driveway, he slowly enters holding the gun. And when he calls out for Walter Jr. and Skylar and gets no answer, it would make him assume the worst. But when he opens up the bathroom door and sees Skylar taking a bubble bath, he's relieved to see that she's safe. And after asking about Walter Jr., he's able to breathe a sigh of relief when she tells him that he's out having dinner at Lewis's house. And knowing that his family is safe, he can actually relax for a second. But with the gun still in his hand, he's reminded of the danger that he's in and he quickly goes over to Holly's nursery to get his money. But by him abruptly leaving Skylar in the middle of her talking, she yells for him to come back. But Walter ignores her while packing his money into a diaper box. And before he's able to put the gun inside, Skylar's yelling forces him to return back to her. And he just keeps the gun in his pocket for now. And while sitting at the edge of the tub, Skylar just wants him to talk to her. And right when it seems that he's about to come clean to her, his phone rings. But he just pulls it out to ignore the call. And before he can get another word out, he sees flashing car lights poking through his curtains. And already paranoid of an attack from Tuco, Walter gets up to see who's in front of his house. But when he pulls back the curtains and sees Jesse in his driveway, he gets annoyed and goes outside to see what he wants. But as he approaches the car demanding answers from Jesse, he would see Tuco emerge from the back seat with a gun and telling him to get in. And just like Jesse before him, with no other choice, Walter looks around before he slowly gets into the car. And as they drive away from his home, Walter fills the gun that's still in his jacket pocket and he would discreetly take it from his pocket and put it into his sock. And when they get a couple miles down the road, Tuco would take their phones before putting them in the trunk and driving for hours to an unknown location. And after a while, the heat would cause them to pass out in the trunk only to be awakened by the blinding sunlight when they're pulled out by Tuco who's aiming an M16 rifle at him. And while Walter is begging for his life telling Tuco that he doesn't have to do this, Jesse's already accepted that he's probably going to die out here. 
And although he's just as terrified as Walter is, it's not that difficult to know who he really wants. And if that's the case, he doesn't want to delay the inevitable by going into this little house just to die. And he tells Tuco, Hey yo, if you're gonna, if you're gonna kill us, just, just get it over with yo. And as Walter tries to speak for Jesse saying, No, no Tuco, he, he didn't mean that. But as Tuco closes the trunk, he walks right up to Jesse without breaking eye contact with him. And like a switch has been flipped on inside his head, out of nowhere, Tuco would go on the attack and he knees Jesse right in the grind, having him fall on the ground. He then picks him up by the neck and pins him against a nearby wall. And as Walter tries to de-escalate the situation, Tuco shuts him up by aiming a rifle at him while he continues to beat Jesse until he finds himself on his hands and knees right in front of a nearby ditch, begging for his life. And while Tuco holds the rifle to the back of his head, he would call Walter over to his side while he pulls out a pistol from his waistline. And while pointing the pistol at Walter's head, he would hand him the rifle that still pointed at Jesse. And Tuco gives Walter an order saying, Okay Heisenberg, now shoot him. Tuco please, no, I, I can't, please. Walter says trying to refuse the rifle, but Tuco forces it in his hands, and while standing right behind Walter with the gun to his head, he tells him, Either you're gonna shoot him, or I'm gonna shoot you, then I'm gonna shoot him. Now do it! And even with the gun to the back of his head, he finds it hard to pull the trigger on his former student, especially hearing Jesse from the ground crying that he doesn't want to die. And after a few seconds pass, and Walter still hasn't pulled the trigger, Tuco gives him a little motivation by starting a countdown. Five. Four. And Walter's hands begin to sweat as he feels the cold steel against his scalp pressing harder and harder with each number. Three. Two. Tuco says pulling the hammer back on the gun, and Jesse would tightly close his eyes as the tears fall into the sand, and he yells, Mr. White, just do it! And before Tuco gets to one, Walter says with watery eyes, I'm sorry, Jesse. And he fires a single shot to the back of Jesse's head, killing him instantly. And as his body slumps over halfway into the ditch, Tuco would take the gun away from Walter, who right now is on the verge of breaking down, having just committed cold-blooded murder of his own partner. But Tuco snaps him out of it when he kicks Jesse's body all the way into the ditch before telling him, Come inside, Heisenberg. Don't want you going belly up on me no time soon. And as they go inside the house, Tuco leaves Walter standing in the doorway while he goes into the kitchen. And as Walter takes a look around the tiny rundown home, he sees an older man who's in a wheelchair with a bell attached to it. And before he's allowed to even take a seat, Tuco comes from the kitchen with a gallon of water and sets it on the table, but he wouldn't be allowed to take a sip until Tuco does his lie detector on him. And after a solid 10 minutes of eye contact, Tuco puts his head against Walter's now believing that he can trust him, and he pushes him down on the couch to allow him to take a drink. And as Tuco walks around to comfort his grandfather, he sits across from Walter and lets him know that his place just so happened to get raided by the DEA only a day after what happened with Nodos, which he defends wasn't even his fault that his own man didn't know his place. And after going on a meth-fueled rant about not trusting the people you love, Walter simply listens trying not to upset Tuco, but in his mind, all he can think about is Jesse as he slowly gets consumed by guilt. But when Tuco tells him his plan of going to Mexico to cook, Walter would then speak up telling him that he can't just leave because he has a family. But that doesn't matter to Tuco as he responds saying, You'll get another one. And being too scared to speak out against him, Walter just nods while his eyes follow Tuco around. But deep down inside, an ember of anger would begin to ignite within him. Not only for Jesse, who Tuco hasn't even acknowledged at this point, but also because Tuco just looks at him as nothing more than someone who can cook meth for him. Not a person, or even a friend, but just a slave. So after Tuco takes another bump of the blue meth, he heads back into the kitchen to start cooking, and leaving Walter in the company of his Theo Hector. But as he sits on the couch listening to the Spanish program in the background, Walter nervously begins to shake his leg. And feeling the extra weight around his sock, he realizes that the gun is still on him. And while Tuco continues to cook, Walter begins to think of the original plan of using the ricin. But after what he was forced to do to Jesse, a more sinister idea comes to mind. And after a couple minutes, when Walter's called over to the table to eat, Tuco walks over to his uncle Hector to take the brakes off the wheelchair to bring him over to the table as well. And while his attention is focused on the Spanish program, Walter would quickly reach into his sock to grab the gun, and Hector would see the entire thing. But before he can even ring the bell once, Walter fired, but the shot would accidentally hit Hector right in the throat and causing him to slump over in his wheelchair and choke on his own blood, and Tuco would only have a fraction of a second to react, but in that time, Walter would get another shot off hitting him in the side and having him fall to the ground to clutch at his wound, and Walter's able to get up from the table and knock Tuco out with the butt of the gun, and with his adrenaline pumping, he knows that he's on the clock because the cousins will be here soon. So after finding some tape nearby, he binds Tuco's arms and legs before dragging him out to Jesse's car and putting him in the trunk. And as he drives away, he looks back in the rearview mirror where Jesse was killed and is saddened that he was forced to leave his body behind. But he makes a promise that he will avenge his death because he has plans in store for Tuco Salamanca. 
and he drives off in the red Captain Cook lowrider. But only after a few minutes, Hank Schrader would arrive in the area and would be left with his own set of questions when seeing both Jesse and Hector dead at the scene, with the biggest question being, who exactly was Jesse Pinkman? Later on that night, after hours of driving, Walter finally makes it home still behind the wheel of Jesse's lowrider, and he circles the house looking through the windows to see if anyone's home, and luckily, the house is empty, and Walter nervously opens the trunk with his gun in hand, afraid that Tuco might lunge at him. But when he sees that Tuco still passed out, likely due to the blood loss that he suffered, Walter pulls him out the trunk and quickly drags him into the house. And once inside, he puts even more duct tape around Tuco, starting with his hands and completely binding his fingers and his legs, making sure there's no wiggle room for him to get out. And finally putting a gag over his mouth and even tending to the gunshot to make sure that he doesn't die anytime soon. And after Tuco was all wrapped up, Walter would simply drop him down into the crawl space and throws a blanket down to cover his body. And after closing and locking the door, Walter gets back into the lowrider and drives it over to Jesse's house. And in the middle of wiping down his prints from the car, he notices Jesse's rainy day fund sitting in the passenger seat. And it leaves him conflicted about taking it, but he's not just going to leave it here. And besides, they were 50-50 partners. So as much as it eats at his consciousness, Walter would take the bag of money and start walking home. And while working on his alibi, instead of him coming up with a fugue state story, he would actually tell them the same thing that he told the therapist while he was in a doctor's office. My wife is seven months pregnant with a baby we didn't intend. My 15 year old son has cerebral palsy and within 18 months, I will be dead. Which yeah, if you're Skylar or Walter Jr, you might feel some kind of way, but I'm sure over time you might understand where he was coming from. So after one of the most uncomfortable confessions he ever had to make to his family, Walter sleeps in the nursery across from the crawl space until Skylar lets him back in the room. But with Tuco squirming around under his house, Walter would spend the night listening out for any sounds he might make without sleeping at all. And the next day, after making a breakfast that nobody eats, Walter's left home alone when Junior leaves for school and Skylar just takes off for the day. And even though he's curious about where she's going, he decides to deal with that later and takes advantage of his alone time to visit the crawl space and have a conversation with Tuco, even bringing a plate of breakfast down as well as a bag full of tools. Get up Tuco, I don't want you going belly up on me now. Walter says while shaking Tuco awake, and with his mouth taped up, Tuco would only be able to respond with muffled noises while he struggles in his bondage. And Walter says while eating a piece of bacon in front of him, I'm sure you're hungry Tuco, but don't worry, the human body can go without food for a while. But in case it can't, that's why I brought this. And he reveals a feeding tube that's attached to a funnel. And while grabbing the back of Tuco's head, Walter would forcibly shove the tube up his nose so it can go down his throat. And if you've seen Your Honor Season 2 Episode 1, it's the exact same concept. But with Tuco basically mummified with tape, he wouldn't be able to do anything but squirm and struggle while it happens. And once the tube was in place, Walter pours a couple bottles of Ensure Protein Shakes into the funnel and feeding Tuco the only way he could. But that wouldn't be the end of his punishment, because Walter would then grab a pair of bolt cutters from his bag and he places it around Tuco's pinky toe. And he tells him, Are you ready? And while looking into his anger filled eyes, Walter clamps down on the bolt cutters and severs his pinky toe. And again, all he can do is squirm while his screams are muffled by the tape. And as he kicks out his feet in pain, Walter is still not done with him as he pulls out a small blowtorch from his bag to cauterize the wound and stop the bleeding. But as much as Tuco struggles, it doesn't stop Walter for even a second. And he even starts to enjoy how he makes someone like Tuco cry out in pain. And while putting the blowtorch away, he tells him while ruffling through his bag, Don't worry Tuco, I'm gonna give you a way out. Trust me. He says while pulling out a syringe that turns out to be horse tranquilizer. And he tells him while injecting him, But for now Tuco, you're gonna go to sleep for a while. And as Tuco's vision gets blurry, the last thing he would see is Walter pulling out an M16 rifle, and then everything goes black. But hours later, when Tuco awakens, his blurry vision focuses on Walter who's been waiting for him to wake up. And with Skylar and Walter Jr. still mad at him, they chose to spend the weekend at Hank and Marie's and leaving Walter with the house all to himself for the next few days. And he says to Tuco who now has a wire that's attached to his taped up hands that leads all the way to a rifle that's positioned just to the right of Walter. And he explains, I'm glad you're awake, and I told you that I was going to give you a way out, and well, here it is. Walter says while holding the bolt cutters, all you have to do is pull that wire and this will all be over. But until then, he says while snipping off another one of Tuco's toes then burning the wound with a blowtorch, once again leaving Tuco in complete agony as he lets out muffled screams while sweat and tears drips from his face. And Walter leaves him in the crawl space with the hopes that Tuco would take care of himself before the weekend is over. But with each passing day, he starts to get worried when Tuco hasn't pulled the wire yet. 
and with his family coming back by the end of the night, when Walter visits the crawl space and he brings down a pillow to cover the barrel to have a makeshift silencer. And instead of taking a toe this time, Walter decides to take one of Tuco's legs and cutting all the way up to the knee. And despite the excruciating pain, Tuco refuses to give Walter the satisfaction of killing himself. And even after his leg's gone, although there's no getting used to the torture schedule, when seeing Walter grow frustrated with each visit, he gets a sense of joy knowing that he can still get under his skin despite him literally losing a pound of flesh. And when his family does eventually come back home, Walter surprisingly manages to keep a healthy balance between his nights with Tuco and his days with Skylar and Walter Jr. But after a week of this routine, when Walter has to go out for chemotherapy, he leaves the house for the first time in weeks. And with Junior in school right now, him and Skylar make their way over to the oncology center. And while Tuco sits in a crawl space now with no legs and a feeding tube hanging from his nose that's crusting over, he thinks about pulling the cord not wanting to endure another day of this. And when he hears the front door of the house open, he starts to get ready for Walter's daily visit. But the person walking through the door would actually be Walter Jr. who came home early from school that day. And when going to fix himself a cup of water, when seeing the brown smelly liquid coming from the sink's tap, he takes it upon himself to see if he can fix the water heater. And he goes into the closet and starts hitting it with his crutches, but that doesn't work and he opens up the crawl space to get a better look underneath. And to his surprise, he sees a taped up and bloody Tuco Salamanca curled up in the corner with no legs and barely alive. But in Junior's eyes, he sees an innocent man who needs help, and he goes into the kitchen to grab a cup of water. The first thing he does would be to take the gag off his mouth and give him something to drink. And when he puts the cup up to his lips, Tuco's eyes would flutter open. And when he looks at Walter Jr., he remembers seeing him in a picture in Walter's wallet, and he figures that he's looking at the son of Heisenberg right now. And as Junior tries to ask him questions like where did he come from or who is he, after Tuco swallows a mouthful of water for the first time in weeks, without saying a single word, he would yank the cord causing the rifle to fire and riddling them both with bullets until the magazine is empty. And only minutes later, Walter and Skylar return home. But when seeing the closet door to the crawl space opened, Walter calls out for his son. Wal Walter Jr.? But he makes a horrifying discovery when he looks into the crawl space and sees both Junior and Tuco covered in bullet holes and bleeding on each other. And he says, no, 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 please, no. Walter says in a panic as he cradles his son's life to his body. And watching from above would be Skylar who screams out in terror and drops to her knees at the sight of her son, who's almost unrecognizable due to the amount of bullets he took. And Walter says in a saddened tone, Skylar, I can explain. But her cries only gets louder as she says, oh God, oh God, Walt, what did you do? What did you do? And as she gets up and heads to the kitchen to grab the phone, Walter would get out of the crawl space and follow closely behind her. And as she dials for the police, Walter would snatch the phone out of her hand and causing a fight between the two. And in Walter's anger, he would push Skylar to the ground and having her fall on her pregnant stomach. And as he stands over his wife breathing heavily, Skylar looks up at him with fear in her eyes not knowing what he'll do next. And she says while holding her stomach, Why would you do this? And when Walter sees the blood seeping from Skylar's dress, he wouldn't be able to handle what he's just done and he runs over to Holly's nursery to grab the diaper box full of drug money. And before he leaves, he looks back at Skylar one last time who's crying on the floor. And he just says, I'm, I'm sorry. And he shuts the door behind him. Hey everybody and thank you so much for watching this video and I really hope you enjoyed another story from the Heisenverse. And this video will mark the beginning of a brand new series that I'm simply calling The Lost Tapes and basically retelling the story of Breaking Bad from this point going forward. And with how we leave things off in this episode, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about what else is going to be different in this version of the series. And to that, I would just have to say, wait and see. But that's just me. But now I want to hear from you guys. What did you think of this story? Did you like it? Was it predictable? Is there anything that you'd change? Whatever it is, let me know down below in the comments and I'll do my best to respond. But until then, my name is Merge. Later.